Okay, hi everyone and welcome to part one of our pharma communication series under the ASEAN Full Army Worm Action Plan. I'm very pleased to be hosting this session and I'm joined by four amazing experts today to speak on the importance of effective pharma communication and the need to understand pharma behaviour when designing interventions to help farmers improve integrated pest management and control fall armyworm in the field. I'm also joined by our Executive Director from Grow Asia, Graham Dixie, as well as our Digital Lead, Wei Li Wu, who is joining us and, and helping out in the background. I'm just going to move the slide to our next one. And just to say that we have a very heavy schedule in front of us. We have some wonderful presentations prepared. We'll look at lessons learned from previous IPM efforts from the rice sector and the importance of enhancing farmers' ecological literacy from Dr. Hong. Dr. Andy Trisiono will share with us his efforts to understand farmer needs towards fall armyworm control. And Delissa Jiang from CropLife Asia will tell us about some very interesting behavior science work that they've conducted in India to understand why farmers might not be using PPE gear in the field. And finally, we have Dr. Philippe Bujold, a specialist in behavioral science, sharing thoughts on understanding farmer behavior and driving change. Now, just before we start, I just want to run quickly through how to use the Zoom platform today. The key message is that we really want to hear all your questions. We really do have some wonderful presentations jam-packed with information. So please make use of these experts and write your questions in the Q&A box. If you have any comments, if you want to share any research links, if you want to um, say congratulations to one of the speakers or hello or introduce yourself, please do that in the chat box. And please take the time to introduce yourself and where you're from as well because it helps us to get to know who is in the room. If you have any technical problems, you can send a message in the chat. Although note that if you have patchy Wi-Fi or you can't hear very well um, or the network goes in and out, we can't really do much at this end. But you could also try logging off and on as well because sometimes that helps. Now, this is part of a four-part series designed to catalyze action on the development and design of more effective pharma communications on integrated pest management and fall army worm control. This is the session one on behavior, but we have three other sessions this year. You can register for any of those sessions at our ASEAN FAWaction.org events page. Uh, and if you have any case studies uh, or examples you'd like to share with us, uh, we would really welcome those too. So please send them to us. We uh, want a very interactive series, so please give us your feedback and questions in the Pharma Communication Forum uh, at the ASEAN Fall Army Worm Action Forum Pharma Communication. And I know lots of you often ask for a certificate of participation. You're most welcome to have one, but you need to subscribe to this Pharma Communication Forum and share your thoughts before you get the certificate. Um, also, we're always looking for sponsors for our work. So if this series interests you and your company, then please get in touch with us with at faw at growasia.org uh, and we would welcome uh, working with you further. Now just here is how you do get onto the forum just in case uh, you're going to do that, which we urge you to do so. It's a good way to share and build the network. You go to uh, ASEANFAWaction.org, you then click on uh, community in the menu and then you click on the forum number three and you'll see farmer communication. Once you're in there you can start sharing your work uh, with everyone uh, and asking questions as well. Now, my first speaker today, uh, we're very lucky um, to have Dr. Hong. Dr. Hong is a fellow of the World Academy of Science, the Malaysian Academy of Science, and is a distinguished chair professor of Zhejiang University, China. He's a formal, former principal scientist at the International Rice Research Institute, Philippines, and he's recognized internationally as an authority on science, technology, and the implementation of pest ecology biodiversity, ecological engineering, farmers' decision-making, and pest manage ma management. Sorry, that's a mouthful for me, but it's a pleasure to have you join us, Dr. Jiang, and he's going to keep his, his video off because of his internet, um, but you see his smiling face there, and I'd like to welcome you to the workshop. Hello, Dr. everybody. Dr. Hong, yeah. sorry. Hello, everybody, especially pa, pa Andy. Hello, long time no see. Uh, shall I, con uh, you control my slides or? Okay, yep. thank you very much. Okay. Uh, since I'm going to talk about rice, I just switch, 
have a short introduction about rice. Rice is grown and feeding millions of people. It's, it's a wonderful crop. It has very few insect pests to, to think of. And those who are very destructive pests are actually secondary problems induced by insecticides. Uh, farmers, therefore, has very little or no productivity gain from insecticide use at all. And from our work, we found that more than 90% of the farmers' sprays are misuses. They are wrong timing, wrong target, wrong chemical, wrong concentration, and very uh, poor sprayers. So actually, farmers are better off if they are not using any insecticide. Next. Here is a piece of work done by some economists at Erie, and you will see that there are four treatments, and the no spray with treatment is always coming on top. So the more sprays the farmer administer, the poorer is the benefit. Next price. Next one. Here are paired experiments. That means the same fields with the same farmer and there were nine, more than 900 farmers participating where they reduced insecticide use by 78%. And the mean yield were even, in fact, a little bit higher. Thank you. Next slide, please. So it is, farmer sprays will cause other problems, environmental pollution and uh, health to themselves and the risk of destruction destruction pests like the brown plant hopper. Brown plant hopper, which is the most severe pest of rice today, is induced by insecticides, which disrupt the natural biological control. The rice IPM programs have established, were established to teach farmers and make, and so that they can rationalize and change their practices and reduce or completely stop insecticide use. Next one. A piece of work done by Professor Wei and I some years ago, we concluded that insecticides are really not needed in rice and so-called pests, which most entomologists list, should be reassessed before insecticide use is to be compensated. Next one. Next slide. An FAO in uh, 2012 actually adopted this principle that most tropical rice crops under even under intensification conditions require no insecticides. Next slide, please. This is a slide of Indonesia, by pa Andy. You will notice that the, from 1985 to the year 2000, uh, uh, almost 2000, the rapid Rapid reduction of insecticides were primarily because of subsidy reduction. And, it, and uh, farmer fuel schools were introduced in 1990. And even as farmer fuel schools were introduced, insecticide use had, uh, were increasing. Next slide, please. Here's a slide showing the flow of insecticide use over, over the years. And you will notice that as farmer fuel schools funding stopped around early 2000, insecticide use escalated. Next slide, please. And why was insect I, rice IPM program not sustainable? So in the 1980s and 2000, a lot of money had been spent to, to educate or train farmers in intensive training by farmer fuel schools. And at least 5 million of these rice farmers were so-called FFS graduates. But when the donor money stopped, FFS trained farmers returned to their old practices using calendar spraying. Next slide, please. Here's a recent slide uh, provided to me by James Fox, James Fox of Australia and Unita of Indonesia. And you will notice that most farmers in this area were spraying seven to 10 times where actually they are not necessary to spray any. Next slide, please. Why such huge investments 
were not sustainable. And here are some of the lessons we, we, we should learn from. Two things stand out very clearly. One was training will focus primarily on knowledge with insufficient ecological content. And farmers' knowledge increase, but they have limited understanding. The governing systems were not reformed to support any of those changes. Next slide, please. I shall start with governing uh, policies. There are perhaps two sets of governance policies. One is those policies that counter the new, new practices, and the other one are sets of policies that will enable the use of uh, the new technologies. Next slide, please. Those counter ones. Those counter ones are really existing policies uh, in, in, the, in, in the field of in various countries. For example, Poisons Act. In many countries in Asia, they have Poisons Act, but pesticides are not included as poisons. And therefore, pesticides continue to be sold as pro uh, consumer products. FMCG, fast moving consumer products. And also, they usually uh, very weak implementation of, uh, of the policies. Malaysia, for example, uh, the Pesticide Act has, is very poorly funded in implementation and understaffed. Corruption is a huge problem in many countries, example, Thailand and Vietnam. And implementers sometimes are under threat from hired gangsters when they visit uh, the fields, uh, namely Vietnam and Malaysia. Next slide, please. Here is a piece of paper, a paper published uh, in, in 2013 about in Vietnam in particular. So despite of very advanced new regulations developed and policies developed, the government were unable to regulate pesticide uh, market. This is primarily due to, from this paper, weak governance structure, large corruption, too close relationship with farmer, uh, with the government and the pesticide industry, and information distortion through sales promotions. Next slide, please. Why is insecticide overuse so rampant? What are the main forces? Next slide. Next slide, please. First, as I just mentioned, is because far pesticides are sold as consumer products. When and pesticides are sold as consumer products, they completely counter all the principles of IPM. Uh, I give you an example. Uh, insecticide use in IPM should be based on economic rationale. But when a insecticides are sold as a consumer product, it will be based on e emotions, desires, and fear, and uh, perceptions, and the sense, and of, of course, the price. Next slide, please. And th there is very abundant use of fake information in, in the marketplace. Uh, fake information such as insects are always needed when you want yield. And when farmers listen to this, they, they react. Uh, we are getting new pests because of climate change and, and so on. Things like this are very, uh, farmers are very vulnerable to this kind of fake information. Next slide, please. The enabling policies, there are not many in Asia, in Southeast Asia. I want to give an example, and that is the Korean, Korean Environmental Friendly Act. In Korea, they enacted this act uh, many years, several years ago, to, intent, to incentivize the, the use of sustainable technology in, in farming. And they developed a new department and new staff and new buildings so that they can implement this act. Next slide, please. This act, in this act, uh, some of the important features are like they promoting permaculture, which is a production system that mimics the vegetable, uh, plant, uh, vegetables and plants growing in nature. Aquaponics and hydroponics, 
crop rotation and uh, planting of trees and other crops around the, on the rice, which is, which is ecological engineering and huge pesticide reduction programs and use of eco-friendly pesticide pest management methods. Next slide, please. What have the, the eco-friendly eco products means that they are either using less insecticide or use of uh, and uh, using biological methods. They develop a certification program and labeling pro and, and labeling uh, program to facilitate the, the use of these products. And uh, and also there are fines imposed uh, by if they are non-compliance. Next slide, please. And as a result, in Korea, you see this kind of landscape. Next slide. And another example of landscape where farmers actually plant flowers and, and they are credited for planting flowers next to their rice fields. Next, next slide, please. What happened? Pest, uh, fertilizer use in Korea dropped immediately, almost after the implement uh, introduction of the new act. Next slide. Insecticide use also dropped. In addition, they introduced a new, a new uh, act called the Insect Industry Act to promote the use of insects at, as biological control agents. Next slide. Next is next reason why this is a uh, lack of adoption is the lack of ecological literacy, and this deepens farmers' pesticide dependence. Next slide, please. Training focus on information and uh, knowledge and skills. However, this not necessarily translate into improving their understanding and decision and practices. In most cases, sometimes after training, there is a temporary change in farmers' uh, practice, but this is as unsustainable. And quickly, farmers quickly revert back to using pesticide as before. So, like for example, most farmers are taught to recognize spiders, but they never understood the biological control dynamics of what spiders do. Next slide, please. So in our work, we try to try to understand farmers and the tools we use were a, a, a complex of many and I just introduced discuss a few. One is what we call ethnoscience. This is a study of folk information, folk knowledge, folk concepts and folk classification so that they, we can understand how farmers see the world. We also discover the languages and uh, words the farmers use to refer to various co concepts and to discover their, and also to discover their attitudes towards pest losses. Farmers are loss adverse. They are not risk adverse as we are all completely mistaken. Loss, they are afraid to lose something rather than uh, afraid to take the risk. All these studies are important so that we can understand how we can develop innovations to improve communication. Next slide, please. Another set of uh, techniques we used were what we call focus group discussions and uh, knowledge attitude practice surveys. Focus group discussions or FGGs are conducted in small groups and uh, in a farm setting where we sit around, around the area drinking, drinking tea and the purpose is to discover how, the hows, the whys, the whats, and the wheres from the farmer themselves. These findings are then developed into belief uh, questions to, to measure belief attitudes and changes. And then they are put in place into KAP surveys so that we can discover how extensive such particular attitudes and beliefs are in certain areas and the results are used to develop communication approaches. Next slide. 
from people making decisions. We adopt a few concepts from, uh, from psychology. And one of, one of the concepts of psychology is how farmers make decisions. They usually use a satisfying model and very simple and frugal in rationalities, the, the attitudes. And, and they rely primarily on what we call rules of thumb, simple rules of thumb or heuristics. Next slide, please. Because those rules are within farmers, they, have, they set up the rules over the years, they tend to have some uh, error prone. And it is our job as a researchers to discover what are the errors or biases of the farmers rules and then develop interventions to, to overcome their, their decision-making process. Next slide, please. This is generally how we develop those rules. The, the rules need to be meaningful for the farmer setting and consistent to the ways they see the world and something and a rule that something they can act on. Next slide, please. So the use of communication, uh, use of psychology was, was used many, many, on many occasions to develop games, analogies, farmer experiments, so as to enhance the learning of the ecology. And then we have techniques to communicate these rules over a wide area because there are millions of farmers and uh, training them in small groups are gonna take a lot of money and time. And uh, I shall discuss a little about multimedia campaigns, education, entertainment education programs to upscale to millions. Next slide, please. One uh, principle we use was cognitive dissonance technique. You see many farmers, in, in, many rice farmers like to spray the crop early in the season. They think that by doing that, they will protect their fields, but this is completely reversed uh, uh, when Ecological research show that this, this is more unnecessary, wasteful, and even damaging. Because at the early stages, huge diversity of predators migrate into the field from neighboring habitats, and the spraying will be counterproductive. Next slide, please. And because also because of plant compensation abilities, the small damages on the leaves in at the early stages have little mean, little yield consequence. Thus, using all these concepts, which is still into a simple rule, spraying in the first 40 days of your crop is not necessary. Now, when farmers were presented with this rule, which is complete in complete conflict of what their normal thinking, they are in cognitive dissonance. And to help farmers resolve this dissonance, we invite them into to perform experiments with us uh, where half his field will not receive any insecticide in the first 40 days. Next slide. Here is an example of one of those experiments and you, we, we show here, farmers re reduce their sprays from three to two and then finally to one and then zero. Farmers spraying early in the crop reduced from 68% to 20% and then to 11%. And the main change of the of were beliefs in the leaf feeding insects. They changed from uh, believing that they were causing severe damage, yield loss and had to be sprayed early were all re much reduced. Next slide. We use multimedia campaign so as to reach as many as people as possible. And uh, one of the way, one of the example I want to show, share with you is in the Mekong Delta. The, it is called Bagyam Batang, three reduction, three gains. And the campaign was using leaflets, uh, billboards, and, and was launched by uh, the minister. Uh, and, uh, and we found that farmers' practices changed significantly. Next slide. 
Here's an example of those uh, leaflets and uh, posters. Next slide. And an example of billboards along the roadside. Next slide. Some results, and you see that uh, in, in two problems, you see that there's mark reduction before and after of seed rate, nitrogen rate, insect drastically. Next slide. So in conclusion, the, that campaign, the sprays reduced from 13, about 13 to 33% seed reduction reduced by 10% and uh, nitrogen by uh, 7%. 7 there were marked changes in the uh, farmers' beliefs in, in, and, and that has made them sustain those practices. The Ministry of Ag Agriculture of Vietnam adopted this Bagyam Batang principle and, and then further introduced to other provinces, which we estimate eventually reach about 3 million farmers. Next slide, please. The next, the last uh, topic I'll talk about is ecological engineering. The aim of ecological engineering is to restore the biodiversity in the field and conserve, restore and conserve the biodiversity so as to increase the biological control ecosystem service. Next slide. We did a very large experiment over three countries in multiple years to, to ensure that this, this principle had worked. Next slide, please. So those fields with flowers and without flowers, there was a marked decrease in insecticide of 70%. Next slide. And yields were increased in those fields with, with flowers. We did a detailed uh, economic analysis of labor and materials used in the two practices and found that ecological engineering had a 7.5% increase in profits. Next slide. In addition, it also enhanced the local honey production. Next slide, please. You will see marked changes in the landscape in Vietnam. Next slide. Next slide. And here are some examples of those changes. Now, ecology, we use another technique to ex, uh, extend ecological engineering to farmers. And that was the ecological engineering television series. Next slide. And then we used the principles of edu education and ent entertainment education in, in order to develop this series. The purpose of that is to both entertain and educate farmers so as to change, change uh, create a favorable attitude so that, so that they can shift the norms into the new behavior. Next slide. Now, one of the important principles in the ecological engineering was to, to enable farmers to appreciate biological control. And one was, and more, in rice, the most important was parasitoids. Now, farmers have no concept what parasitoids are. They, to them, they are pets. And they also have no concept of what parasitism is. So since bees are bigger and easier to observe and well-known, we taught farmers to observe bee populations as indicator of parasitism. And parasitism, cons and then we created a new name called small bees for parasitoids. Next slide. In addition to that, in, in the television program, we introduced this whole concept in three simple rules. Flowers on the buns provide food to attract bees and small bees. Bees and small bees help me control brown hopper invading my fields so I don't need insecticides. And if I imply insecticides, it will kill the bees and small bees. Next slide. 
here are some results and the, of the television viewers and non-viewers, and you will notice that there's marked increase, not decrease in seed use, marked decrease in nitrogen rates, and marked decrease in 24% uh, of insecticide use. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to conclude because of time and the main conclusions I have here are in order to promote uh, biological, uh, uh, to promote and practice biological control, we need to develop par in parallel ecological training of farmers who ultimately are the par uh, implementers. This is the ecological knowledge or ecological principles will build their confidence of using the new practice. For researchers to learn, we need to, for researchers to learn farmers about the constraints the farmers face, their beliefs, the perceptions and practices. And we need to develop new innovate, innovative ways to communicate to these millions of farmers who need this help and in, to, for them to appreciate and practice biological control. Now, mass media is a powerful platform and uh, we need to develop innovative ways to, uh, to use ma mass media to cultivate these new norms. Also in parallel, we need to initiate policy and structural reforms in, or, or new policies to accommodate the new practices. Now, without these kind of reforms, the new practices the new norms will not be sustainable as, as you can see in the IPM FFS programs. So we need to identify opportunities for new policies so as to make adjustments to the current one in order for us to implement a sustainable uh, implementation of biological control or ag in agriculture. Thank you very much. Any questions, I'm, I'll be pleased to, to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hong. I hope uh, everyone can hear me now. And that was a uh, extremely excellent, very detailed presentation. There's a lot of food for thought. And I just want to remind everyone that a copy of the presentations today and the recording will be posted on our website later in the week. Um, I also encourage you now, if you've got any questions for Dr. Hong, to put them in the Q&A box. Um, Dr. Hong, you, you talked about a lot of interesting points and it's quite hard to know where to start, but I found a particular comment quite important and that was your view that farmers are loss averse, not risk averse, because we often hear that farmers don't want to take risks, but I think the way you frame it here really resonates uh, as well as smallholder farmers being loss averse, not risk averse. Do you have any further examples of how to use this in the design of a program? For example, could it be that insurance policies for smallholder farmers could be important here as a way to support their that loss averse or that behavioural change uh, thinking? H how do you s sort of support them? I... I uh... <laughs> Part of it, I could not hear because there was some flux in the internet. But uh, I did hear about insurance policy. Is that yes. what you... Yes, yeah. yes I'm just thinking of a way to support farmers to take on that sort of, to make them less loss averse. Yeah, yeah. So uh, during the Green Revolution, insur insurance policy was introduced. Now the, the trouble with the insurance policy at that time was the insurance companies tie up with the chemical companies and, uh, and, and farmers buying the insurance have to follow a schedule and, uh, in order to, to gain from, uh, if they have a pass outbreak, to gain the, the, the repayment from the insurance company. Now, it is extremely difficult to, to, for, to develop an insurance that requires to do nothing. You know, so my brother is an insurance agent and I described the problem to him and I said, I like to develop something like that. And he said that if that is the case, farmer people will learn that they don't need to pay the premium and eventually the company will lose money. So no insurance company will take this up. So our, our objective in the insurance company, the insurance policy 
is to ensure that the farmers don't need to to, to spray, and which mm. is completely difficult, is a difficult thing to implement. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got a few questions here coming in from the audience. Uh, the question here is, does the data around pesticide use, does it also include fungicide? Uh, most of the data I presented were primary insecticides. So okay. uh, not, not, not necessarily fungicide, no. Uh, Here's a question. How long does it take to change farmers' practices? Almost instantly, if they understood and appreciate the concepts behind it and uh, feel very confident that whatever they're doing will not render them crop losses. So it's almost immediate. So if you teach them to recognize the natural enemies, that's not enough. You need to demonstrate uh, how those natural enemies help them and how by spraying actually will destroy it. And uh, that that kind of training. So that if the training includes those kind of things, there's a little more chance that they will have uh, more uh, confidence in the new practice. Great, that's an important point. Um, great answer. Here's a question from Susan Knight. Uh, Thank you for your very thought provoking talk. I agree there is an urgent need to increase ecological literacy. Can more be done to educate younger people, the next generation farmers, since they may be more receptive? And can such subjects be included in the school curriculum? Mm -hmm. We actually tried that in uh, Thailand, uh, where we tried to include uh, uh, ecological content into uh, high school uh, students. We did that for two years, uh, high school. The problem is uh, in, a, in a country like Thailand, less than 10% of the farmers, of the children we trained went on to farming. So kind of hard in a sense to re retain, uh, retain uh, that kind of information, uh, that kind of uh, training in, in, the, in the market, in the real marketplace. So most of them just gave up training after high school they they do not go they do not go farming. Oh, interesting yeah. point. Uh, is, and for those that did continue, did, was was that potentially useful for that ten percent though? Yeah, those who those who, who did follow, I mean, uh, who had that had that uh, training, did who did and and then uh, went back to farming did have that knowledge, but the problem is he has to uh, deal with his father who has a very deep feeling of the of pesticides. And uh. in those farm areas, the, the only advisor of pest management are the pesticide salesmen. So, so he's, you know, he has the new knowledge, but no confidence to practice it because his father tells him that he will lose his crop. So that becomes a, a, a deterrent. There was no, as I said, it, it, it boils down to the policy. There was no policy to remove some of the uh, unfavorable conditions. Uh, excellent. And I think that actually leads uh, into another question here. Olivia Reynolds said, terrific presentation. Thank you. Can you please elaborate how you ensure that these farmer behavioral changes and practices have a legacy, that they're continually implemented by farmers? For example, do media campaigns need to run long term? Do you work with government to ensure government policies are reflective of these changes? I think you just alluded to that, that the policy needs to be in parallel. Do, how long do these media campaigns need to continue, do you think? Those media campaigns or television programs need to continue for a couple of years and with the support of the government. And in parallel, the government need to make some modification and adjustment to some uh, constraints in the environment for these practices to carry on. And if those uh, policies were not adjusted, uh, and as soon as those programs uh, go away or stop, people return, return to their old practices. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. That's probably a good place to leave it. Um, excellent presentation. Um, so uh, full of detailed information. Um, you've got a few questions still there, actually quite a few, Dr. Hong. If you could just um, jump on the Q&A, you'll be able to yeah. answer some of those questions in writing and we would really appreciate okay. that. But thank, thank you. you so much for, for coming on and sharing your, you know, huge experience and knowledge on the subject. We, we really value that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Andy Trisiono. And Andy actually works closely with us on the ASEAN Full Army Worm Action Plan, in particular on the resistance work. So it's always a pleasure to have him back to join us. He is a professor of entomology in the Department of Plant Protection at the Universitas Gajah Mada uh, in Indonesia. And he's focused his research on uh, insect resistance management and integrated pest management and experiences uh, working with smallholder farmers. Welcome, Andy. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let you share yours. Well, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank to Croatia for um, having me to participate in this uh, seminar. And um, thank you, Dr. Helm. Good to see you again, and nice. uh, I think what you presented uh, make my presentation a bit easier because you have already shared the uh, principles, the theories, and also some of the practices. So um, I built my presentation based on the uh, experiences since I do not have any uh, educational background related to the communication and um, other behavior, but I do have a um, uh, been working with um, a lot of farmers, uh, especially smallholder farmers in particular for rice. And I think in the last maybe 10 or 15 years, I've been also working with rice, uh, uh, with corn farmers, um, mainly on the Asian corn border. As you might know that the uh, Pola Mewon was realized to be in Indonesia in the uh, uh, mid uh, 2019. And then uh, we had a pandemic since 2000. And so, uh, in fact, I do not have uh, more direct uh, collaboration with the corn farmers dealing with the uh, with the uh, uh, one. But we do have uh, meetings, we do have uh, chatting in regard with the one with different stakeholders. So I'm going to share my experience with rice farmers and then I'll try to bring my experience from the rice farmers to what we should be uh, do or what could we do with the corn farmers? So I'm gonna start with two different events uh, that I had in the past uh, regarding with the um, uh, rice farmers. First, which is about 10 years ago. Um, at that time, I worked with uh, one group of rice farmers in, in Klaten, Central Java. And it was during the outbreak of the brown in in It was the, I think, it was the highest uh, outbreak um, in the last maybe um, uh, two decades. So it's about 230,000 hectares were infested by the brown plant hopper. And here we go. That this is one of the pictures that I had that I took uh, from one of the sites in Klaten. And in this size, um, uh, the farmer told me that they did not harvest and gain some yield in the last four rice seasons. So one day I received a letter to, from one of the um, uh, leader in the um, village and asking for some assistance from, from our department to deal with the brown plant hopper because there, I mean, uh, the people in his village did not have any yield and they even sold the motorcycle to buy um, a pesticide and they used the pesticide, but still were not able to control the brown plant hopper. So, um, just a, a day or two days after I received a letter and then I came down and then went to the field and this is my first meeting with the farmer leaders, with the uh, leaders of the uh, local government at the village, as well as the uh, um, the leader of the uh, society. So it's only a few people that I met and um, uh, I think I delivered, hopefully I delivered a very clear message at the time because this is very, very um, uh, important for me, as Dr. Hyam already mentioned, that 
Uh, Indonesia has been implementing uh, IPM since uh, 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 1989, and you saw from um, you also saw from his uh, presentation that insecticide use is still uh, something that we we are concerned and still uh, big uh, uh, usage of uh, insecticide or pesticide in general for rice. So um, when we had a, a problem like this, so what I what I said at the beginning of the first meeting is that. I do not have the money, okay? so I did not bring any money. What I brought is only one hand, two hands, and two feet. So let's work together and decide together what we need to do to deal with the plan plan offer. So uh, that's the message that I, del I delivered at the beginning of uh, our meeting. And in the back of my mind, I decided to focus on the uh, pesticide reduction because I got the information from them that they sprayed more than 20 times per season, but they still do not have any seal at the end of the uh, season. So this is the, uh, the data that we had um, from the first season. After we work together, we observe together, we make the decision together, but in the back of my head or on the top of my head is that, I did not want to talk about the IPM as the way we talk about uh, in the uh, uh, Farmer Field School of IPM. But my first um, destination or my first objective at that time is one is to reduce the pesticide use, and second is to gain the yield because that's what were needed most for the farmers to gain yield. But we also see that the pesticide use is just you know, exceeding uh, what is supposed to be as uh, Dr. Hayam mentioned uh, in his presentation. And what we had at the time is during the first season is that we, we still use our pesticide application, especially insecticide for four times because the population of brown banana corn was huge. So migration from brown in field was almost every day. So is it, this is not the local population. We spread because of the migration, because of the population that coming into the field. And this is not only one or two hectares of field, but it's about 80 to 90 hectares of field with one group of farmers containing 25 farmers. So what we, what we achieved during the first season is that we can reduce the pesticide use from over 20 to only four times. And we can yield 75%. It's not completely, um, similar to the yield when they have uh, no ground plant hopper. But again, this is a big uh, success for the farmers because they did not harvest any yield in the previous four season. So having 75% is a good achievement. So uh, it is very, very important to me and I, I think it's also for the farmers to have the, uh, what do you call it, the benefit right away when we uh, deliver the program. And after the first season, that, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, that we could reduce the uh, pesticide use and we gain 75% uh, of yield. Representative of the farmers came to our campus and meet with the dean, meet with the rector, and asking for uh, continue of the collaborative learning process. And I should emphasize the word collaborative learning process. And because we do not want to teach them, but we work with them and uh, be in the field and make decisions together. And what happened in the second season? There is no pesticide application at all because the population of the predator is always uh, higher than the population of the plant plant hopper. So during the first season, when we applied pesticide four, time, four times, we also uh, showed them that when we apply pesticide, we kill the plant plant hopper, but we kill also spider and lady beetles and other other species that are living they were living in the rice ecosystem and uh, uh, slow, slowly but uh, surely and they start recognizing and believing the role of natural enemies i think that was the reason why there were no application of insecticide in this uh, in this uh, uh, season which is the second season and we work with them for five seasons which is uh, starting from uh, 90 hectares, and then uh, at the light, at the last season, we work with uh, 300 uh, hectares of rice farm with, with them. So 
Um, uh, again, this is a, um, I want to mention to you, but this is a direct uh, um, action reset uh, from our department to the farmers. And we did not bring any specific project, specific program, but we work together and try to identify what were the uh, most needed by the farmers at the time, which is gaining some yield because the experience is not having yield for four season. And we added the, um, the, the, the objective is that by um, reducing the pesticide application, as Dr. Hale mentioned, that just try to rationalize uh, in using the pesticide. So this is what happened in, in, in Gladden about a decade ago. So the second and the second story is a bit different because this is a, something that we had the money because there was a, a project funded by the FAO, it's a collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture of Indonesia with uh, FAO Indonesia. And I was um, involved as an expert uh, in, 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 in designing and also um, uh, assisting the farmers. And we uh, used the word uh, landscape, uh, which is a little bit different from the past IPM implementation in Indonesia. Um, this is because of you know the learning process, the experience that we have for many years that the outbreak of the plant plant hopper is usually start from small spot of um, hopper like this. And when we re saw this kind of uh, fields, usually the farmer left his field because they knew or he knew that he wouldn't gain any yield and they did nothing. Uh, uh, but we as an entomologist, we know that this population can be the resources for uh, many different fields surrounding as well as in other fields because uh, uh, brown plant hopper can migrate for uh, long distance as well. So uh, again, the, uh, understanding the ecology, as Dr. Hare mentioned, is very, very important. But the word that we use is try to use a very simple word as, you know, um, which is probably the word that is our surrounding or uh, commonly said by the farmers in the local uh, society. And here you go in the end of the season, because this is uh, the project run for uh, three seasons. It's, it's different from the IPM implementation before, where the project was usually only for one season. But this is, we were very lucky that we had the funding for uh, running the uh, program for three seasons. So it had some, um, um, you know, some um, um, space, some freedom for us uh, to create, but um, again, the, the, the basic um, principles uh, that we also introduced the for the farmers is also the best management uh, principles. And uh, similar to what Dr. Heung said, that we also applied the uh, ecological engineering by planting different um, uh, uh, flowering plants surrounding the fields and also using the biological control agents such as the um, well, Beuberia bassiana, Metarisium uh, anisophilia, and other things that also work well for controlling the uh, ground plant hopper in, in special and outer insect pests that attacking the rice. And uh, the approach that we use during the uh, landscape IPM program funded by the uh, FAO, uh, we, we implemented uh, or we used two different uh, approaches. The first one is the social engineering, because as I mentioned earlier, that pest migration is very important and not many farmer understanding about this and and um, and all the big outbreak always start from the small, but we usually neglected the small um, small uh, damage uh, because of uh, the economic reason that the farmer do not have the money and they also uh, do not have yield at the end of the season. So they, they ignore the, the, uh, the, uh, the attack rice field, which is the sources of the um, uh, migration for the surrounding farmers. So what we do very um, uh, focus on this is that try to make the understand, uh, make the farmer understand about that. The responsibility of the management of small plot that's infected by the pest is not only the responsibility of the farmers that own their fields, but it has to be the responsibility of all the farmers in the farm because they're supposed to be knowing that 
these small population will be even bigger at the end of the season and when it's huge population and then they will migrate to their, uh, their fields. So understanding and working together of the farmers in the farm is going to be the key success for um, management of the brown plant or, or rice patch in general. So this is the key point that we introduce and we try to make them understand and practicing and uh, incorporate it into their mind that they need to work together because PEST does not recognize the administrative boundary, does not recognize the uh, border of the uh, ownership. They will go wherever they want to go. And as an entomologist, we know that management based on field by field is not going to be solving the problem, but probably using a landscape which is much bigger, it can be a it can be a good way and a good good approach because usually it will insect will attach to the and it will be affected by the surrounding environment. Okay. The second one is the ecological engineering. I do not want to spend too much time on this because Dr. Hyang already mentioned uh, with a great detail on that. And the third one is uh, we still use the farmer field school as the way we did in the uh, the beginning of the IPM implementation in Indonesia. And this is a, just a few pictures to show to uh, to you, and a few uh, statement that emphasizing some of the messages that I want to deliver. Farmer field school is still, still mean the delivery, and we noticed that it's very very important to include women in the group for the training. We can see the differences where the group did not have any women, and the group with one or two or even three women in the, in the group. The dynamic is different. And we know that the role of the woman in the family, it could be different from one family to another family. But still, uh, we saw, we learned the importance of women in the training process. Okay. This picture just to show how important educating the, uh, the children, you know. And as we know that flowers are good for children, good for us, it's good for the aesthetic as well. And at the beginning of the um, uh, the projects, uh, the flowering plants was uh, usually damaged by the by the children because they pick it up, they cut it, and they use it for for playing around because they still did not know what what the rules and what the function of the flowers in the in the fields. But this is one of the extension agent that you know I explained to the student uh, elementary student, and after that, and then they contributed. They planting the uh, flowering plants uh, uh, around the barns, around the creeks, around the uh, uh, the village road. Um, so make it beautiful and in some places it becomes uh, uh, like a top local tourist area for, for some of the people and taking pictures. And again, um, I think the support of the government as Dr. Uh, uh, Helm also mentioned is very, very important. And But also finding the uh, the uh, the village leader, which is having um, uh, the same or sharing the similar platform as we have, I think is very, very important. We were very lucky that one of the uh, projects that we had, we had a, a young, you know, um, village leader. He was very eager to learn. He was very uh, futuristic in terms of, you know, how to make the uh, uh, farmers live better uh, because most of their uh, uh, citizens are uh, relying on, uh, on agriculture. So um, selecting and having and talking, um, you know, uh, setting the platform, uh, setting the similarity and the, uh, the objective, I think that's a good, a good start for the success of the programs. But support from other stakeholders, in this case, um, our university, department and faculty, and uh, FAO, of course, from the Department of Agriculture, for sure, I think it's also um, Playing a good role in, in determining the success of the uh, of the program. So uh, I just mentioned three key points um, that we uh, that we learned from those two events. First is whatever that uh, we want to deliver uh, to the farmers, identify and work on the top priority goals to get immediate results. So as I mentioned, that uh, my immediate results or the, the, the objective that I wanted to achieve at the time is pesticide reduction and yield. So I did not want to talk about the IPM in detail at the beginning because it's, as you may know that it's not easy to implement the IPM at the beginning. And 
the, the farmers were in a desperate situation. So we have to deliver benefit uh, as soon as possible. Second is working with the local leaders. Uh, and the third is hit and run programs will not work for delivering the agrarian program. Need continuous effort. I'm going I'm to move to, um, to Paul Amiwong right now. This is a profile of the Paul Amiwong in Indonesia. The infestation uh, first occurred in 2019 with um, around 32,000 hectares um, in 2019, with uh, 30, 23 out of 24 provinces were uh, attacked by this insect in 19, and uh, it uh, enlarged or uh, spread to 20 out of 34 provinces last year, with a total area invested uh, increased to 113,000 hectares. And in many cases, and especially in irrigated areas, most of the rice farmers are also the corn farmers. I think that's the reason why, you know, uh, I just uh, starting from rice because sometimes the people are the same, the ecosystem is a bit, a bit different, but I think uh, the behavior or the way of thinking is the same because we are dealing or we are working with the same farmers. And this is the picture that I took in uh, 29 in, uh, in Lampo. This, um, white area of corn were heavily damaged by the uh, one. It had been replanted. The farmer had sprayed three times, and the corn still been uh, very heavily damaged. But our uh, laboratory and cleanup studied using the same insecticide that the farmer actually used worked very well. So um, that's the reason why I put the title as a knowledge gap. So the insecticide itself. When it used properly, it's going to be working very well for controlling the front farm, uh, the controlling the whole farm. But because the understanding of the ecology, the bioecology of the whole army worm, and how to use the insecticide properly, which is going to be, I think, uh, our next speaker will be talking a lot about uh, this, is, is, is still there is a gap. And this is something that needs to be filled uh, uh, in addition to reducing the use of pesticide or the use of biological control agent. But how to use the pesticide properly is something that is also very important subject. And Two minutes, Andy. Know, I'm sorry? Two minutes, Andy. Okay, sure. Uh, I think I just um, two or three more slides. This is this is the uh, um, something that we, we know from the from the field that we have a uh, different crop plants. We have two major insect pests attacking the corn and also uh, the population of the poor farm and woman occurred. So this is the kind of information that we, we need to gain to be able to uh, deliver and um, uh, uh, have the right program. So this is my last slide. So what do we need actually from the farmers? Um, first, immediate results. So I do not say what it is, but I set the criteria because farmers from one village to another village or from one district to another district might have different, uh, different uh, society different uh, background, different behavior, different ecosystem. So that, why, but whatever the, uh, the program, whatever the uh, uh, behavior, whatever the ecosystem condition, I think delivering immediate result is gonna be good to gain trust from the farmers that this program is gonna be working. Second, simple and workable program. And I think Dr. Heng mentioned using the word of you know, small and big piece is going to be much more uh, understandable rather than using the word of parasitoid and uh, and whatever the the jargon that usually the entomologists use. Okay, the third one is medium term of assistance. So, in my experience, uh, one rice growing season or one corn growing season is not going to be enough to deliver the the full package of IPM. So, probably two or uh, three seasons is going to be much much better. But at the same time. We also need to start fostering uh, self-reliance. So these are the four criteria that I want to share with you uh, based on my experiences. Uh, we do not need to start one by one, but we have to we, we got to start at the same time, but make sure that the first one is gonna be the one that will deliver results immediately. So thank you very much, um, Alison, and hopefully I did not pass the, um, the time that you set up. Uh, thank you.
No, that, that was great, Andy, and, and thank you very much. And lots of good information uh, in your presentation as well. I mean, with really a lot of rich information shared today and still more to come. Uh, some questions for you. Uh, do, do you think this sort of IPM then, how we talk about it at the moment, is just sort of too complex then for to, to talk with farmers about? I mean, you seem to say that it's really good to just focus on simple messages to start with, or even a simple part of IPM rather than rushing in and talking about integrated pest management as a whole. Is, is that your un, your understanding? Yeah, I, I think so. For example, in, in the case of um, um, uh, rice farmer in Indonesia, um, um, because to make the decision, we have to do the observation to see what are the population of the best and the natural enemies. And, yeah. uh, and most of the farmers did not do uh, uh, um, observation before making the decision. So this is something that you know um, we have to deal with because uh, not all the farmers are 100% working in the field. But they yeah, work in different uh, areas, you know. Uh, so farming is just uh, maybe the second or the third, the third uh, jobs that they have. So spending too much time on observing is something that we need to uh, pay attention on that one. So making uh, a, a simple way, like uh, Dr. Hale mentioned, that having a good indicators of the ecosystem that will help the farmers without spending too much time like the way we do research in observing the ecosystem, I think it's gonna be a, a great way to uh, to uh, equip with the uh, IPM uh, school because I think that's the most, uh, what do you call it, um, not necessarily complaint, but it's a concern from the farmers to do the observation weekly and <laughs> make a lot of effort on that and let's uh, make it more complex. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's the same thing with when we talk about political control and then we have to rear the political control agent and then uh, uh, you said, and it's, it's complicated. I think which is this is uh, when we contrast it with the pesticide use, it's just totally different. Pesticide is very easy. So I yeah. think this is the thing that you know we need to consider at the beginning. You know, good point. Yeah. Um, I really liked the the part at the start. You're talking about sitting down and having a cup of tea with the farmers, which I thought sounded mm -hmm. quite nice, but also really useful. Just sort of sitting down and having a discussion with them, and that sort of almost co-creation of solutions together with the researchers and, and the farmers. Um, how, you, had, you said you, it was a five season project, that initial project that you started and you, you ended up with 300 hectares, I believe. It was, was it costly to do? I mean, it was very successful, but is it costly to do such a project or? Uh, not necessarily because uh, all the material, all the inputs were coming from farmers. The cost that I, I I have is just you know for buying gasoline to to drive my car from my campus to the uh, to the location and also yeah. buying for my lunch you know but uh, providing uh, but we did not provide any things for the farmers except yeah. for the pesticide when we when we use mass spraying you know I I, I contacted the company that um, uh, because we had a previous uh, research showing that the uh, brown plant hopper in Java were resistant to certain group of insecticides, but we also did some research looking some alternative insecticides. So when we had a problem, we already had the data from our research. So that's why we, we, we brought that results to the field. And because the insecticide were relatively new, so we had a support from the, actually from the pesticide industry uh, for, um, for spraying at that time. But other than that, we do not spend any money for buying fertilizer and meeting and so okay. on. We do not do that. And uh, Andy, what, what are some of the ways that farmers in Indonesia, uh, what's the best way to communicate? I mean, you've just given one really good example of actually just meeting with them, talking with them, working with them and understanding like person to person. Uh, does We had some examples from Dr. Hyung, Hyung before of television, um, I think the radio maybe, posters. Do, what, what works well? I, I mean, I've seen quite a few people on Facebook, for example, uh, Indonesian farmers, is there anything that works really well or is it just dependent on each community? Um, yeah, I think uh, the, you see the uh, communication system work very well. I mean, it's, it's good to, to, you know, to, to achieve much bigger um, audiences. But I think talking with uh, a farmer personally, especially the right person that we talk with, 
because yeah. he know that he is the leader in the society. I think that's a it's a it's, it has a great impact. And okay. I mentioned about uh, the role of the woman in the group is also very very important because they she might not be working directly in the field, but she might be the one who manages the economy of the family. Excellent. Okay, well, that's a great place to leave it. Thank you. It's sort of identifying a leader there that can kind of be an influencer in the farming community and making sure you're connecting with women um, from that community as well. Thank you so much, uh, Andy. Um, brilliant presentation. You've got lots of questions there, I see, that you could probably help us out with um, in writing. So feel free to jump on and, and answer some of those. But thank you for joining us. Great presentation again. And uh, we really appreciate having you on board. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. My uh, third speaker today will be Delissa Jiang from Crop Life Asia, where she's the Director of Sustainability and Advocacy. If, if Delissa, if you could just um, load up your presentation, that would be great. Um, Delissa works closely with the government, farmer and supply chain stakeholders to promote sustainable agriculture and good stewardship practices in Asia. And she's currently focused on innovating approaches to stewardship, including incorporating behavioural science into farmer training. Welcome. Hi we everyone, see, thank you, Alison. We can see your slides. Thank I you. know, I'm just, uh, I think I need to swap the screen so that I'll just, sorry, give me a moment to do that. No problems. Okay, there we go. I think you can see my screen in PowerPoint mode now, can you? Perfect. Great. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Delissa and I'm from Crop Life Asia. I think uh, so far we have excellent speakers to tell us about the different ways of communicating to farmers. And uh, today my presentation is actually to highlight uh, one of the case studies that we have done by applying behavioral science to drive the uptake of PPE for farmers in India. And um, so in today's presentation, I would share a little bit on how we have been communicating traditionally to farmers. And then why is it that in the process of examining our current approaches, we decided to explore behavioral science and what exactly is behavioral science and how has that been used around the world. And then later on, I'll share a little bit of the findings that we have in our case study in India. And then I'll round up with some lessons on behavioral science for farmer communication. All right, and so how have we been communicating to farmers? As you can see here, uh, we have several pictures of how we have been communicating to farmers. And these are also examples that have been shared by Dr. Hyung and uh, Dr. Andy. Uh, it has been done in classrooms, we have done live demonstrations, we have gone down to the villages uh, to talk to the children, to the uh, mothers. And we have also put up billboards and posters. And these are examples that are not new. I think um, in, in the presentations earlier, you have seen some of these pictures also. And in Crop Life Asia from 2005 to 2015, we train over 15 million farmers in Asia. And despite the extensive training over different types of training modes, there are still a lot of concern around how uh, there is a misuse or a lack of safe practices in pesticide application. And so this made us think like, what is wrong with our traditional stewardship approach? And so the first problem that we identified is assuming that knowledge would immediately translate into action. But we know that this is not true. Um, how many of us actually know exercise is good for us, everybody, but how many times have we found ourselves snoozing on our alarm, even though we decided to wake up slightly earlier to put in some exercise into our routine. Similarly, for all smokers, it's not that they do not know that smoking is bad for health and increases the, cause, uh, the chances of getting cancer, which is a very deadly disease, um, yet it has not stopped many smokers from quitting. Similarly, we are training farmers all the time on using pesticides judiciously, and yet we still see that there are a lot of concerns that persist on the unsafe use of pesticides. So when we try to tackle this first problem, we realize that it is because there are many factors besides knowledge that influence the way we behave. But then there comes our second problem. The second problem is that when we try to identify other factors, it tends to be very anecdotal assumptions that we make and is lacking in evidence. So for example, when we do a brainstorm on why is it that farmers do not wear PPE, 
um, a lot of reasons are cited by all of us. Oh, because they don't know which product to use. They find it very costly. They find it very uncomfortable. They find that they do not understand the importance of safety. But with so many reasons being cited, how do we know which one uh, are we you know, barking the right tree? And um, all of this information is something that we could have heard from the farmers on the ground, but it is lacking in proper evidence for us to identify what is the right problem so that we can increase the in return on investment of our training. And so this is where behavioral science comes in. So what exactly is behavioral science? Behavioral science is an interdisciplinary field uh, that borrows from psychology, behavioral economics, and design thinking. And using this intersection of three disciplines, um, we try to understand the complexity of our minds in making decisions and therefore design more effective solutions. So I use this picture on the right because I really like this um, picture in describing what behavioral science is about. So in our brains, we can imagine that there are many different buttons. And you know, as, as you know, if you press a button, maybe a certain door opens. But there are so many different buttons in our brains because we're very complex people. And maybe when we do training, we're pressing just one button in that brain. Uh, but there are several other buttons that might be opening the doors that we're not pressing. And therefore, behavior science is trying to use a holistic perspective by borrowing from different disciplines to understand which are the right buttons to press to create the desired behavior. And so a very simple example and a very famous example of what behavior science is about um, is in this picture here. So you can see on the left is an instruction of um, how you should be aiming properly when you pee. And this is what we're doing in our training. We're telling them, do not do this, do not do that. And what you see on the right is a picture that was taken in Singapore Changi Airport. I know many of us are missing that place right now, um, are missing airports in general. But um, so in this urinal, there is a fly, uh, a fly sticker pasted at where you're supposed to aim. And, and in this picture, uh, what, what happens here is that they are hoping that the person who is urinating would be aiming properly, not by giving them mere instructions or knowledge or training. Um, you know, all of us are actually toilet trained and, you know, so, but uh, what, what is happening here is that they're pressing a different stimulus in the brain. So, for example, it could be using the psychology of game, right? So, all of us, um, when we play games, we want to win. And so, the idea of aiming at the fly feels like a game of darts where you feel like you need to aim properly. So, it changes the psychology of your behavior. Or it could be that you have always associated a fly with a news, uh, as, as a nuisance and therefore you definitely want to aim properly because you want to kill the fly. It doesn't matter whether or not this fly is real, it just changes the psychology of our brain. And this is what behavior science is about. It's about pressing different buttons that could lead us to the exact same behavior that we actually desire. Another example is in a restaurant where you have two bottles on the restaurant menu. There's one that's $30, there's one on, uh, that's $50. And the waiter comes and tries to encourage you to buy the more expensive bottle. And they tell you that this bottle comes from a great vineyard, you know, it, it has a certain quality of wine that you would definitely like. But truth to be told, how many of us really know how to appreciate wine? Um, I think most of us cannot really tell like, you know, big difference between uh, uh, two different wines. Um, that are not that different in equality. And so no matter how much the restaurant waiter is telling us how good this wine is, being money conscious, we pick the $30 wine. And so what happens in this case is that they know the restaurant would understand that, oh, actually this consumer is not using knowledge as his driver for making decisions. It is using money. So by understanding that we are driven by this money um, to make our decisions, they introduce a new bottle onto the menu. And no, now knowing that $150 sounds like a really good of wine because we attach the monetary value um, to, to the value for money. And, and so we see that, okay, I can't afford $150, but now this $30 bottle looks like a really bad bottle of wine. So I think I'll go for the $50 bottle. So in this case, um, consumers would then choose the middle ground. And what happens here is that they're not using knowledge of what the wine quality is, but using our frame of reference on money to push us towards the desired behavior that the restaurant wants. And if we bring it closer to home, uh, this was uh, one of the case studies that was shown in Kenya where farmers uh, that they interviewed, almost 100% of them said that they would want to use fertilizer in the next season. But when the actual season came, only about a third of farmers used fertilizer. 
And during the behavioral science research, it was found that the reason for this is because during the time that they interviewed them, it was during the harvest season. So they are flush with cash. They see the benefits of, of, of using a fertilizer for crop growth. And because of that, they are very encouraged um, to use fertilizer again. But when it comes to the actual season where they need to plant, um, suddenly they're short of cash and that immediately dominates their decision making and they decide, okay, maybe I can do without it, you know. And, and so because of that, there's a great fall in the numbers. So in this case, what was done for behavioral science was to create a pre-purchase uh, program where at the harvest season, a fertilizer voucher is being given out. And because during this time, farmers are flush with cash, uh, there's a lot more receptiveness to purchase these vouchers. And then the fertilizer is only delivered during the planting time when um, it is delivered to the farm exactly when it is needed. And based on this experiment, the number of farmers using fertilizer doubled during this uh, by using this uh, commitment device. And so what, what is here, like we said, is that there are several factors that uh, influence our behavior, whether it's to do with chronic scarcity or time, as in the case of the farmer, or whether it's to do with our physical environment, the mood, um, the choice set, for example, in, in a supermarket, uh, you would know that the placement of your product is very important, or the social context, how does your um, friends view you, um, and, and that's the case of how, um, you know, Andy was talking about engaging women and children, because they pr uh, provide a very strong social context. There are also psychological factors that we have to take into account. What we might do in my country in Singapore would be different from any other country in Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia. Uh, there are hassle factors involved. We also have a limited attention span with the number of information that is um, exposed to us. And therefore, what happens to us is that we tend to focus more on the present, on the immediate and short term, or we tunnel our vision to something that's the most urgent or pressing. Lastly, behavior science is also data-driven, uh, meaning that there is a, a methodology in place. And here I've taken the methodology of Ideas42, um, the firm that we're using to help us in our project in India. And so what I would like to say about this methodology, I'm not going to run through all of it, but it's to show that behavior science is also data-driven. Uh, results are rigorously tested to see if we're barking up the right tree. And then we test some of the designs that we think um, targets the right behavior. And if it doesn't work, we try it again. And so behavior science is, is a, a good way of also measuring impact before we scale up our solutions. And behavior science is not something that is, um, is, is relatively new, but it has already been adopted very widely in the world. So the, the article on top is from World Bank, which shows that about 202 government entities are already using behavior science in public policy. And in the OECD um, picture below, it also shows the extensive number of government and non-government institutions that are already be applying behavioral science. And it is because of this that we decided to also explore this is, um, again, a slide from the firm that we are using, Ideas42. And as you can see, they have also extensive projects in different sectors. Um, and some of the impact looks like um, helping to increase the use of contraceptives among women seeking abortions by 7.2% in Nepal, increasing savings among low income in the Philippines, or reducing household consumption uh, by 5.6% in Costa Rica. So as you can see, there are many diverse ways that behavioral science can be used, and agriculture is definitely not an exception. So let me move on to the case study uh, that we had done in India. I had shown this methodology earlier, and so we have not completed the entire project. We are right now halfway through the design phase. Unfortunately, we're unable to do the testing of our designs on the ground due to COVID right now, so it has been slightly delayed. Um, even then, the, the results that have uh, shown from the first half of the project is very interesting and insightful in how we communicate to farmers and how does this differ from our traditional approaches. So some of the project findings that we found through interviews uh, was that there are about four to six main barriers for farmers putting on PPE. And these reasons include farmers using incorrect rules of thumb to decide when PPE is needed farmers holding faulty mental models around PPE components, 
having inaccurate perceptions of pesticide exposure, and being present biased when making PPE-related decisions. There are also hassles involved and the fact that farmers tend to focus more on product-related rather than safety-related information when purchasing and talking to people who can provide that safety information. And the first time we saw those results, a lot of us were like, yeah, we already know this. We talk to farmers all the time. Uh, you know, we, this is not new information to us. Uh, but then Ideas42 brought us back to our, our beginning of the project where we were citing reasons for why farmers do not use PPE. And these were some of the reasons uh, that were raised during the initial conversations, that PPE is costly, that they expect us to provide it for free, and because they don't wear it because they are embarrassed, they feel that peers will find, uh, find it funny if they wear PPE. However, from the interviews that were done based on data-driven research, there was no supporting evidence or weak evidence to support these claims. So as we can see here, you know, it's not that maybe this, um, these reasons are true to certain farmers, but it may not be the, the exact button that needs to be pressed in the brain to create that desired behavior. And I thought this is where the value of behavioral science came in and uh, the result of doing some uh, rigorous interviews that borrow from uh, interdisciplinary uh, fields of psychology, behavioral economics to see a farmer as a whole. The other thing that behavioral science helped us to do, as you can see here in, in the red boxes, is to help us to identify these reasons, not so much as an anecdote, but in casing them and casing them into psychological terms that we can therefore take action on. And based on this, um, psychological terms, scientific terms that were used, some of the proposed designs are like this. So for example, for 40 rules of thumb, being I'd be able to identify that psychological term, we are able to exactly identify and address the behavior barrier. Uh, if they have inaccurate understanding, then maybe we could use uh, an aging app to simulate how you look like uh, in OH with or without chronic exposure. Um, if they're not able to see the risk of pesticide exposure, could we use glitter and food coloring to show them the actual residue that's left on their bodies if they do not wear PPE? So these are some of the sample designs, but these sample designs uh, have become more accurate because we are able to encase the problem that we see into actual psychological terms that we can take action on. And so I've come to my last slide and um, I would like to sum it up by, by bringing you to this big chunk in the middle called context. So a lot of times in our traditional approach we just assume that just having knowledge will immediately translate into action but what we do not see is that there's a huge chunk in the middle called the context and behavioral science helps us to use a, a scientific data-driven and measurable method to identify the right contextual factors that can press the right buttons in the brain towards action. And based on these factors, we can design more accurate and effective training. What is, um, and, and whether or not we, we use behavior science uh, in, in terms of the actual expertise itself, I think it's important to understand that uh, for farmer communication, we have to see that a farmer is more than just a farmer, which is what we tend to see when we think of our target audience when we do training for farmers. But a farmer is also a father, he could also be a mother, he could also uh, be an uh, influencer in the village like uh, what Andy was sharing. Uh, he's also maybe somebody who likes shopping or it doesn't even need to be a farmer. As a human being, he likes games. He likes, um, he finds certain things annoying like a, a sticker fly, for example. And also, uh, finally, I would like to share that even though we, we think of, you know, there are like millions of farmers in Asia, how are we going to reach out to all of them? How costly is it going to be to reach out to these farmers? But I think based on some of the examples that we shared, some of these um, tactics that we can use to increase their behavior do not necessarily need to be costly to scale. For example, the fly sticker or introducing another bottle to the, to the restaurant menu. These things are not particularly expensive, but by pressing the right button in the brain, we could help to improve outcomes at very high returns, even though it may not be costly. And so I think this was very insightful for us. And I hope this also provides some process in, in your thinking to help with farmer communication, because I think uh, communication for farmers in Asia is so varied and different. And, and what we need is to really uh, identify this context in, in different countries and different cultures 
and, and thereby improve our communication to farmers. And so this comes, um, I've, brought, I've come to the end of my presentation and I'll invite any questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delissa. That was uh, very interesting to hear about that work. And um, I'm sure we'll get an update later on in the year or next year uh, as it continues. Um, and it, I think you, you really did underscore the importance of understanding farmer behaviour and decision making uh, as part of understanding what potential intervention might be needed in the future or, or the way that we communicate to farmers. So, so thank you very much. Um, and there's a question here, uh, maybe you could clarify, could you please let me know what kind of PPE gear that you introduce to the farmer and do they feel comfortable to wear or use it? Yeah, so the standard PPE is, is to wear the gloves, the goggles, the boots, uh, and, and the overalls. And whether it's comfortable to use, um, like we said, it was one of, the, one of the factors that we identified could be uh, one of the top six reasons why, why farmers do not wear PPE. And so in the case of, uh, in, the, in the frame of behavioral science, our, our concept is to, is to really help them to overcome this hassle. And even if they don't feel comfortable wearing it, they have to understand that it's safe for them. But how can we do so with behavior science? So let me just draw a parallel example. What else do we find uncomfortable in our lives to do? Exercise, right? Um, we know that exercise is good for keeping us fit, but we find it uncomfortable. Uh, it, it causes us to perspire. It, 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 is, it causes our body to ache after. So how can we overcome this? So for example, in, in the case of, um, you would realize that there are a lot of social apps out there that help you tra track, your, track your fitness workouts with your friends. So by doing this, you know, even though it's uncomfortable, it is made better by doing it with your friends. And, and so one yeah. of the, the ways that we could overcome this discomfort of the farmer is to create a buddy system, for, ex, uh, for example. Or in, in, uh, there are also certain government initiatives where they have, um, if you clock a, some, a certain number of steps, you could convert them into supermarket vouchers. And, and so, so they're using another monetary incentive to cause you to exercise, even though on its own independently, it is uncomfortable. Yeah. And tell me, um, you, one of the suggestions was the physical re redesign of the PPE kit components to sort of a one piece item. I guess it's quick and easy to pull on in one piece. Are there any examples of this in other countries? And, and if so, did you see if that increased uptake? Uh, no, so so far, I think it, it hasn't been something that we have, uh, like I said, this is only some proposed designs that we're thinking Yeah, no, no, of. it's a great one. I was just um, wondering if somebody else had tried it. But but I guess what, what somebody here is, there's a comment here from the audience that one of the reasons that farmers don't want to wear PPE is that it makes the farmer hot while spraying due to hot weather in many of these countries. Is, is that something that, that farmers just have to put up with or is there a way that it can be made cooler I'm, I'm not sure but did that yeah. come up as a concern um so like I said it, it is more of like the the hassle thing in terms of yep. uh PPE uptake it has been a persistent issue that we've been trying to tackle definitely the comfort the use of the fabrics that we use uh how user-friendly it is has been things that we've been thinking about uh certain of our member companies have also done um certain competitions to see whether they could find out what's a comfortable PPE to wear. So okay. definitely we're thinking of all kinds of ways, but like I said, you know, we can think of all kinds of ways to solve different problems, but what behavioral science is trying to do is to help us see which one we should zoom into. What is the main reason that people yeah. are not putting on PPE? And then we, we try to fix that um, accordingly. And otherwise there are just so many reasons that we could cite on why farmers do not wear yeah, uh, PPE. Yeah, of course. And something that I think Andy um, brought up was just this, the, the gender element as well. And I, I grew up on a farm myself and I remember my dad spraying with a backpack with a pesticide in, in the backpack and it was a c coloured dye so that you weren't meant to uh, put it on yourself, only on the, on the target. And he used to come back covered and I remember my mum yelling at him, telling him how dangerous this was. So in this case, it was actually my mother that was probably the most influential because uh, my dad didn't want to be yelled at. But I think it's just just sort of maybe had a point there around how influential a woman potentially in this in this discussion around PPE gear and safety. 
do you? Yeah, definitely. Um, so in, in terms of women, I think a lot of, uh, again, is, is, is a very cultural thing. And um, in Indonesia and Philippines, our teams, they regularly engage women um, as, as influencers in, in our pharma training and communication. They are definitely very effective. But again, um, th these are all cultural contexts. And so what might work in a certain country may not work so well in another um, and so I think what, what is important and what we are also trying to do is to ensure that, um, you know, that what we do doesn't just become a, a trial and error, but that a lot of uh, the assessment and the measurement of impact takes place so that we could replicate best practices that have worked rather than we try something and then whether or not, work or not it works, we do not know. So I think that's also an important important thing to measure and we're still trying to figure out you know especially now that there is the presence of social media which provides a lot more tracking yeah. how can we use that to to measure impact further and see what works or not yeah no perfect and I think you, you'll find there's a lot of comments in the Q&A Delissa so if you can take a look at those I'm just going to sum up a lot of them and saying um, terrific work but we still need to find out why farmers are not using PPE gear which is exactly what you're working on now so I think people are really excited about your project and will definitely be inviting you back uh, when you've got some further uh, thoughts and results um, to find that come out of this project because I think that's really important and, and what was interesting and in, in just my little anecdotal um, story was that it, my dad did fully knew that it was dangerous to have it all on his body uh, and so he's fully aware of the safety but he did it anyway so uh, it was it's definitely interesting now to talk to him about what was driving his behavior, which I will do when I get home to talk to him. Um, but a lot of people have also raised that concern uh, All right, in thank the you. comments. I, I will answer them, but um, yeah, we're equally excited to see the end of the project because this is the first time that we're doing something like that. Um, and it could potentially transform the traditional way that we've been doing things for decades. And I think it comes very timely because now yeah. there's a lot more new tools in the digital space that, that we could also employ and innovate to reach the farmers. So thank you very much, Alison and everyone. No, thank you very much. And that is excellent. And it really underscores the importance of this workshop today to expose some of these um, programs and research and work and this need for better farmer communication and understanding farmer behaviour. So thank you, Delissa. Thank you very much. If you could just take a little bit of time to answer any questions or say hello to some of those um, people uh, reaching out to you, that would be most appreciated. And thank you very much. Most definitely. Thank you. So I'd now like to move on to our next speaker, and uh, he is a behavioural science scientist, a specialist, Philippe Bujold from the, uh, and actually I'm going to let him introduce it because I'm going to get it wrong, but I think it's the Centre of Behavioural Research, but he was telling me just before, I'm going to let him load his um, presentation, but he him and his team, Philippe and his team are doing some really interesting work in South America with farmers uh, and they very much specialise in this sort of behavioural research uh, decision making um, uh, field. So we're really excited to have him join us, uh, actually from Australia, but Rhea are actually based in Washington DC, I think. So welcome, Philippe. Thank you so much. Um, just want to make sure you're currently seeing my presentation, right? We are indeed. Perfect. It's the, the number one question in 2020, I think. Um, but yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Alison, for, for the introduction. Um, you almost had it right. Uh, I work for the Rares Center for Behavior and the Environment. It's a very long name. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, basically, you can think of my role as quite different, actually, to the other people that presented today. Uh, so unlike actually most people here, um, my expertise is not in ag, it's not in pesticides, insecticides. Um, I actually used to be a behavioral neuroscientist. Um, and so I decided to switch into conservation. Um, and now I work basically in translating scientific evidence about behavior um, into conservation programs. Um, and that is what the Center for Behavior and the Environment does. Uh, so I do this part of this work as part of RARE. Um, that's a conservation NGO who's been around for about 45 years. We've led hundreds of behavior change campaigns um, in Asia, South America, um, Africa. And so that's kind of the perspective I take. And it's going to be super interesting, especially having heard the three other presentations. I'm going to take a bit of a higher level um, approach and just explain to you 
not how to generate necessarily the insight, but how to actually use the behavioral insights to then create a program, um, giving you the example of what we have in South America. Um, so just a bit more background. Basically, the Center for Behavior and the Environment launched in 2017. Um, and it was kind of the first ever think tank, or for those familiar, the, the word nudge unit uh, dedicated to conservation and the environment. And so since then, we've now really expanded into building evidence. Um, so we do a lot of research on our end, but also we do a lot of knowledge propagation and translation for other folks. Uh, so a lot of training, a lot of expertise building. And our main goal, um, which ties in really well with the last presentation, is really to get everyone to be a bit more familiar and to realize that there's not just three levers of behavior change. So a lot of us will think of material incentives, uh, rules and regulations, or information. So kind of the pay them, stop them, or tell them model. Um, and our real focus is to get people to, sure, keep using those ones, but also be aware that there are three other behavioral levers that are super important. And those are emotional appeals, social influences, and choice architecture. And they all tie in with what we've been talking about to earlier today. Um, so before I go into our case study of what our program is, I also want to highlight three high-level insights uh, that are going to be quite important. I wish everyone remembers these. Um, so basically, behavioral insights that are relevant, especially for farmers. Um, and these are going to be the first one that we have a limited or bound cognitive resource. Um, our brain is biologically based. It's not infinite. Um, and so it has to maximize specific things in the environment to be able to be as efficient as it is. Um, so we tend to focus on things that are more in the moment. And so we heard the word satisfying earlier. Uh, basically, we always try to, to get the best of a situation, but not necessarily the most out of every situation. And we're going to be really putting our attention on what is salient at that time. Um, the second thing that has been established in the literature is that we are very uncertainty averse. Um, and here I'm going to make a distinction between risk and ambiguity. Uh, we talked a little bit about risk aversion earlier. I agree, it's not necessarily the, the problem in every situation, uh, but ambiguity is a situation where you don't know what the probabilities of something happening are. So you're just wholly unaware of basically the uncertainty of a situation. And risk and ambiguity are going to be two main drivers of people not doing something. Um, and then the final thing that I want everyone to keep in mind for today is that we are social beings. Um, there's the word conformity bias, which basically refers to our inherent need to conform to the behavior of others and to use others in our environment as kind of indicators of what we should be doing. Um, so if everyone else is doing something, maybe I should do it too. That's kind of the rule of thumb. Uh, we are social beings. And so conformity bias and social norms are going to be very important when thinking about using behavioral science to reinforce or to design programs from the ground up. With that said, I'm going to jump directly into our Lands for Life program. Um, so Lands for Life is a relatively novel program for RARE. Um, we are based in South America and Colombia. And the whole goal of the program basically is to align agricultural ecosystems, um, agricultural productivity with ecosystem productivity, sorry. Um, and so we work with small to medium scale Colombian farmers. Um, so again, step it back from Asia, but here you'll see kind of the logic that uh, I want everyone to take away. Um, so we work in Norte de Santander. Um, it's a province in the upper right part of Colombia. I'm sure everyone can see it on the, on the map. It's right on the border of Venezuela. Um, and so we started our program there, and now we are expanding actually towards the Amazon. Uh, but I'll be showing you basically the insights that we got from that initial province um, from where we shaped our thinking of the program. So the simplest problem we could think of um, when getting there was that we're trying to basically switch some farming behaviors from what is currently being done to some novel behaviors that are not necessarily as proven for farmers. So on the left, we have basically production choices that they're familiar with and over-reliance on chemical fertilizers, pesticides here also, over-irrigation, and the addition of manure to their soil before having compost of it. And then on the right, we have production choices that are sustainable but unfamiliar. So using only as much fertilizer as you need, only as much water as you need, and making sure that the materials you incorporate in your soil are properly composted. And so the sustainable practices on the right are actually better for the farmers. It's in their interest to do that on a purely economic sense, um, but they don't. And so when we're looking at this objectively, um, they would have better returns, they would have better costs, everything would be better. Also collectively, um, more people adopt sustainable practices, more people in the community would benefit. But unfortunately, that is not what we see. 
um, over and over and over, we see people really sticking to those left side behaviors, which are what they're familiar with and what they've been doing for generations. Um, when we got to Norte de Santander, we really wanted to understand why is this happening? Because previous NGOs in the area had gone in, um, had trained a lot of farmers to do something. So they had a small proportion of farmers that were farming perfectly um, using sustainable practices. But then unfortunately, as time went by, because they saw that other people weren't joining in, they kind of felt unsure about the practices and dropped out. Um, so we really wanted to understand, okay, what are the barriers, the psychological barriers here at play um, beyond the material barriers that you might have? So going into this, uh, we found that confirmation bias was a big problem in the area. And so that is really the, the, the sense that what you've been doing, you will use your past experience to confirm your own point of view. Um, so a lot of time farmers will see that production is going down. Um, there is a problem here, especially in the Andes uh, with climate change, that potentially the weather is getting a bit more variable. Uh, it's not as intense as it sounds, but farmers will always blame climate change for their problems. That's something we found very often um, in this part of Colombia. Um, so instead of looking at their own use of fertilizers, their own use of pesticides, they relied on finding external reasons for why their production may be going down. So they always confirm their own viewpoint with the data they were looking at. And um, the other thing is that they're present biased. Um, so investment right now, even if it's for the future, seems kind of a loss for them. Um, they don't want to invest right away because that's money they could have right now, even though they could save their production for later. The next thing we saw is that they're very ambiguity averse. And so in this case, farmers, it's not necessarily about risk, it's really they don't necessarily understand the outcomes that they could get from adopting new techniques. Um, so they've seen a lot of different information coming up from different NGOs, different uh, information sources, and it's just very unclear to them how significant the benefits could be, or if it's even a cost, because some people have also been spreading that information. And finally, the last thing that we saw in the area is that intensive agriculture, and so those old techniques was really the norm. And so even if you switched, the norm everyone around you was not. And so unfortunately, because we like to conform, that led to a lot of people switching back or never wanting to adopt initially. So simplifying all of this, um, basically what we said was, when in doubt, farmers stick to what they know. And that's kind of the general guiding principle that we have um, for the Lens for Life program. And I'll explain to you why. Um, putting farmers on a resistance to ambiguity scale or a resistance to change scale has been very, very useful in structuring how we use behavioral insights and then how we use different behavioral levers to target different farmers. Um, so if you think of this as a continuum, I'm just going to broadly define farmers in through different strata. The first one would be low resistance farmers. And those would be the farmers that generally engage with NGOs. Um, they're the farmers that are most easy to, con easy to convince and they like to try new things. Um, again, broad swath of the population, but it's good to be able to identify people in their resistance to ambiguity or resistance to change um, variable. The next group that we have would be the moderate resistance farmers. Um, and so for those people, they need to see something succeeding before wanting to adopt it themselves. Uh, so they might be a bit more ambiguity averse, even risk averse, loss averse. Um, they just want to be really convinced that it works before trying something else. And it has to work for someone who's similar to them. And the final population we identified was really these high resistance farmers. And they're the people for whom evidence, social evidence, any kind of evidence might not actually be enough. Um, and for them, for any economist in the room, we're thinking utility terms, uh, the utility of adopting new practices is not just, it's just not enough. So you need to introduce a new cost or a new benefit to this. And the way we look at it is, basically transforming social norms um, and creating social pressure to switch to new sustainable practices. So looking at what it looks like and looking at how it looked like historically, um, we have these three groups. And in the area, we had had a lot of campaigns that were basically recruitment type campaigns. So they would approach the farmers that were most likely to join, train these farmers, and then those ones would carry on. But you never really reached the three other groups. Then there's other types of interventions in Colombia, and those are a lot more modern, usually ICT driven, so technology driven, where you just target everyone with a blanket intervention. And so you get a small percentage of everyone adopting, but if you're trying to save a landscape, that might not be enough. And so what we were thinking was, how do we get all three groups um, at minimal cost, really, or comparable cost to the other programs using behavioral science? 
And so what we're going to try and do is look at what are the different levers we can use. So for one, we need minimal evidence. That's probably going to be quite similar to what we used to do. For the second group, we're going to try and convince them of the benefits with social proof. So the more relevant the evidence is for them, the better it is. And for the last group, we're going to introduce social pressure. And so we do that in three different phases. And basically what we're going to do is in the first phase, do a lot of what we've heard today, uh, simplifying the existing evidence, trying to create shortcuts and better rule of thumbs for farmers. The next step of the process is going to be to generate that social proof and make it very observable for everyone so that everyone can find someone who's similar to them who has succeeded in these practices. And then the next step is going to be to generate social pressure and by changing norms in the community. And hopefully in the end, that gets us a collective result as opposed to just one segment of the population um, switching to new practices. So going into a bit more detail, and this has been the blueprint for Lands for Life as we've started in Notre de Santander and as we've been ex uh, expanding in different areas of Colombia. Um, so in phase zero, we actually create a cohort of eager innovators uh, who will stand as model farmers and educators for the rest of the program. And in phase one, we publicly showcase their work and successes and use this to create medium resistance farmers, basically to reach medium resistance farmers into our program. Finally, in phase two, we leverage our low and medium resistance farmer, especially their numbers, um, and reach out to non-farmers to make sustainable agriculture more than just a norm in farming, it's a norm in the community. And so essentially what we are doing is what so social psychologists refer to as laying the foundations for a norm. Um, and you can think of it as a checklist where what we want to do is make things as easy and unambiguous as possible. Uh, we want to communicate the benefits to the rest of the community. We want to generate the impression that others expect compliance. So a lot of this is pro-social behavior. And so we are able to use that final little checklist point um, to reach our goal. So going to more details, um, in phase zero, Lands for Life basically offers individualized training to farmers that approach the program, and we provide them with decision aids, uh, timely practice, specific advice, um, and access to our two-way messaging platform. So we have an SMS platform where we can send them nudges um, and where they can talk, contact us for help. And really what we want is that these innovators, these early innovator farmers, um, find the process as easy as possible and that we generate as much success as possible. So we really invest a lot in these early innovators. And at the end of phase zero, what we do is actually have a graduating ceremony where they are basically celebrated in the community. They receive um, a, a little prize, a little certificate by someone important in the community. In this case, it was either the mayor or a priest. Um, and then they're also basically turned into little local celebrities, um, a bit like farmer champions, which we heard about earlier today. Um, then we have phase one, uh, which starts right after this public recognition event, uh, where we basically launch a social marketing campaign. And this social marketing campaign is entirely tuned to highlighting individual benefits um, of adoption by promoting the successes of farmers who have adopted and succeeded. So basically promoting these local celebrities, the, the early innovators. And so here the target, like as I said, are medium resistance farmers and where farmers can join the program directly at public events, which we host many during this uh, second phase, or they can join through SMS. And then they actually get to attend classes taught by our early innovators. So they see people like them teaching them how to do things. Um, they also get access to the SMS platform to help ease their transition into sustainable farming. Finally, um, the last bit is our Oh, sorry, those are pictures. Yeah, so just to show you a bit what it looks like. Um, on the left, we have these peer uh, workshops that we have, and then we also have um, different recognition, um, basically inputs that they can have. So they have this agroclimatic station that makes them observable in the community, and they also get uh, their certificate when they publicly graduate. Yeah, so going into the final phase and um, for phase two, so the social marketing shifts all about highlighting individual benefits to highlighting collective benefits to the community. Um, so a growing proportion of the community is now expecting you to farm sustainably because everyone now understands the benefits of farming sustainably. So community events here are very anchored in traditional events. So we have traditional plays, songs, school activities. Don't worry, we have a team in Colombia. It's not a guy sitting in Canada that decides this. Um, and there we basically highlight the positive externalities of farming sustainably. And we continue to reinforce the, the good work that the initial farmers and adopters were doing. 
And so this is at this point that Lands for Life exists in communities. Um, once we've turned the initial social proof that we've generated, the what we call a descriptive norm, into social pressure, which is what we call an injunctive norm. So what you observe to what people expect of you. And so this new status quo reaches a point of self-reinforcing equilibrium. And that's when you know you've generated a new norm and you've actually hit all of your checklists um, pro-social norm creating uh, items. So we've made the ask easy, we've made it unambiguous, we've communicated these benefits, and we've generated an, an impression that everyone expects compliance. And so this is one part of our last phase where we actually create a big mural in the communities where people can identify with what a, being a farmer means and really see the benefits. So not just farmers see this, everyone in the community sees this. So again, this is a recap of our Lens for Life program. Um, just like the program that was before, it's actually ongoing right now. And we are uh, experimentally testing it. Like we said, behavioral science is data-driven. Um, so we will be publishing the, the final results at some point in the coming years. Obviously, things have slowed down with um, COVID, but we are in the middle of the program. Um, so, so it's been ongoing. We have really positive results. That's been great. And for everyone who's been listening, if there are three things that I can ask everyone to try and retain uh, at the end of this are just the three insights that I had before and thinking about how we can address these with different behavioral interventions as opposed to just paying people um, teaching people how to do things with information or policing people. And so again, we have a limited slash bound cognitive resource available to us. So using simplified information delivered at a timely moment um, is great. We are uncertainty averse, so here risk or ambiguity. So let's try to make things feel less uncertain by giving people social proof, a proof that it works in their community for people like them. And we are social beings. So social norms are either work with you or against you. So it's always good to try and engage with norm changing activities using that little checklist um, I had before. And for anyone who's interested in kind of adopting this way of thinking, uh, generating basically program insights from behavioral science. We actually have a platform um, called behavior.rare.org where we try and help practitioners um, gain, learn from these insights and really apply them to their work. Um, so it's a great platform, it's free. Um, so anyone who can join you can also get connected with a behavioral scientist. And we also have these two guides, which are basically recaps of all the behavioral evidence that exists in the field. Uh, one of the topics is literally in agriculture, so that's great. And then we also have a guide on how to apply behavioral science in practice, covering all the different frameworks that exist, not just ours, um, so that you guys can pick and have the most informed view of behavioral science when you apply it to your work. Um, so that is it for me. And I thank great, you great, listening. Philippe. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to tell everyone we're going to be probably about three minutes late because I want to ask you some questions. Um, sure. So if people could just stick, hold in. We won't be very late after uh, the finish of our hour. So, um, but Philippe, you've got a couple of questions here. Um, here we go. Here's one here. Hi, Philippe. I remember in an earlier discussion around farmer behaviour and willingness to change, trust was a cross-cutting issue, right? So right can i trust the information the extension agent is providing me or will this work for me do you think this is a big part of the emotional appeals and how do we overcome this definitely so actually it's good that you bring that up in colombia um we found trust to be a really really big problem that kind of results from obviously the conflict that they've had ongoing for the last half century and um, so they don't necessarily always trust external sources and here overgeneralizing but in Norte de santander we saw that a lot um, and so that's why the social proof aspect is really, really important. It's the same way as people don't necessarily want to buy electric cars or solar power until they see like their neighbor trying it. You can see all the information that scientists tell you or extension agents tell you, uh, but you might not necessarily be the person who's willing to take the risk. But seeing other people succeed and benefit from it is then going to reinforce that, that trust you have in the information if it's people in your community. So that's really something we're trying to hit. And obviously we adapt that when we go to different communities. Excellent. Um, another question here. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It's very informative for me. I have a question. How do you identify which farmers belong to which of these three group, groups of adopters? It's the low resistance, the medium resistance and the high resistance. Great question. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and that's actually a question that, that we always grapple with when we go to different areas. Um, the way we design the program is not necessarily that we impose that title on people. It's more of a self-selection mechanism, if you want. So when we get to an area, um, we don't define people as low-resistance farmers. What happens is we just accept the people that want to join the program and find those are going to be low-resistance farmers for us. And they probably are because they're joining with minimal evidence. 
Um, and so it's a continuum, like I was saying. And for us, it helps to think of it in the way that we structured the program. But it's more when they interact with us that that tells us a bit more of how much utility they put on switching or how much disutility they would put on switching. So, so it's more an indicator of how resistant they are as opposed to who they are as a person, because there are very different groups that fit in each of these broad categories. And do you find, do you think that smallholder farmers are more in one of these groups than the others? Do they, do they seem to be more um, high resistance on average or is it just a mix? What, yeah, what do you find? What we're seeing right now is um, we've been lucky. In one of the areas we've been working with, there is actually a big push from the community to, to be sustainably minded. Um, so there we had a lot of what we would call low resistance farmers. Um, but actually in the newest region we are, we get a lot of MRF, so the, the medium resistance farmers. And so we didn't have a huge chunk of the population join initially, but the social marketing is proving to be very, very effective. Um, so, so yeah, there's no clear distinction or why would it be a problem if, if one happens or not. We just need to basically be adaptable. And because we have um, this SMS platform, we are able to cater to varying sizes and populations. Um, so yeah, I know it doesn't necessarily answer the, the whole question. Um, no, no, that's great. No, I was just wondering if they were different. more conservative on average. Um, I think a question here is that um, how, how important is it, or perhaps valuable, particularly in smallholder farmer uh, context, to try community approaches then to pest management and behavioral change? Yeah, so, so we find the main reason why we turned to behavioral science for this program was that the traditional ways of doing things just weren't really succeeding. So you would either get a few people adopt perfectly or, but the norm would always be fighting against you. Um, so we identified the norm as being a big problem, and that's why behavioral science was a really big tool for us, and using these levers was very important. Um, not saying that it's the best solution for every situation, you usually need a mix of everything, uh, but if yeah. you're facing norms, which we usually are in agriculture, um, it is important to understand how to interact with them and how to change them if necessary. Um, Excellent. And, and just, just one last question on that, I guess it's related. How important is it to consider gender yeah, no, definitely. Um, so that's actually why our, the social proof approach we have is so generalizable and adaptable to different places. Um, obviously, you want proof of people that are most like you. Um, and so if you only have men, then obviously the women will feel left out. If you only have people in high positions of power in the community, people in lower positions of power will feel left out. Uh, so when we get to an area, actually, we do have a bit more money on the sides to try and target people. Uh, that might be in different groups that we identify. And so that's something we have been doing, um, trying to get a really broad swat of the population to hit this. And um, also our tech platform allows us to deliver information that might be more necessary to some groups than others, and we can tailor that. Um, so that has been how we address this. Uh, but obviously what we're really excited about is seeing our big pilot initially, did it affect people differently? And how can we alleviate that in future versions of this program? Um, so that's something we keep in mind. Thank you so much. And thank you. That was a very uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, and it was actually a very nice sort of ending to the other three very good presentations, sort of a slightly different viewpoint, but um, really sort of tied up some of those questions as well that we had previously. So thank you very much, Philippe, for joining us. And I, I hope you'll join us again in the future because uh, we'd like to sort of trial some of those those sorts of uh, things that you're looking at uh, in this region. So thank you very much. We really appreciate your uh, attendance and participation today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And I just want to end with a quick summary. It's going to be very brief. I've just put some comments up. I, I think we heard at the very start around the importance of building confidence of farmers through in-field training, but by also increasing that ecological literacy, which is really important to farmers' understanding and, and motivation to change. It's very important to also understand better the constraints of farmers, their beliefs, perceptions, and practices. Uh, and I really like that idea of sitting down and having a cup of tea with them uh, and actually learning from them 
them and having farmers learn from each other, which I think is very important, uh, as well as developing new innovative ways to communicate to farmers. And I think Delissa also really uh, urged us to look at the, the digital um, opportunities out there now that are emerging uh, also. Uh, very important is to initiate and parallel the policy and structural reforms or new policies to accommodate new practices to make sure that new practices can be embedded uh, over the long term. And also, I think what's quite important was to consider sort of multi-purpose solutions communication. So the communication actually might be quite simple, but it's important that farmers, uh, that we acknowledge that farmers are actually facing lots of different threats, not just ball army worm, or it's not just about one thing. So we need to build resilience uh, overall um, to all those threats to farmer livelihoods. Uh, last two things, actually there's quite a few things in these two paragraphs, but understanding the farmer, the behaviour of farmers and what drives farmer decision making before designing communication interventions is really important. I thought in Delissa's presentation, again, your perceptions of the problem may be very different than farmer perceptions. And I think that was came out in all the presentations. It's really important to understand what the farmer is thinking and what drives their behaviour. Lastly, I really like Philippe, um, these three considerations, we've got limited bound cognitive resources so we tend to focus on what's salient in the moment and often rely on habits so building habits is really important we're social beings so we inherently seek to conform to the norms we observe and we're uncertainty averse so building that into your communication programs and interventions with farmers uh, could be really really important to actually driving norm changes and actually uh, increasing the the adoptance of long-term behavioral change so that's some of the key points there's so much in those presentations though so I really would welcome um, your thoughts and questions after the session please email them to me at faw.growasia.org you can also go onto the website and we will put all the presentation and the recording uh, up online for you um, don't forget that we have three other sessions and we'll be also running our smaller national led uh, discussion forums as well um, but you can register for any of those sessions at the ASEAN FAW Action events page um, please share your case studies we may feature that in session two before you go I would really like you to do a poll because we're really interested to know if this was useful for you so I'm going to launch a polling and if you could just please take the time uh, we won't look at what you voted but we would really appreciate if you found this useful um, I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, just really amazing to see such a breadth of knowledge and to share all that information with us it's really important to designing our program uh, and to helping stakeholders in this region uh, improve uh, integrated pest management and their uh, fall army worm control through behavioral change and communication so thank you so much uh, I'm going to leave the poll open for a bit longer but please take care and I look forward to hearing from you and also seeing you at the next uh, workshop and just before I go I'd like to say thank you to uh, Graham Dixie who's uh, retiring from the executive director role at Grow Asia fantastic to have worked with you and have you online uh, today again a big supporter of the program so it's been great to have you uh, along the way and thank you also to Waylee for helping out today very much appreciated thank you everyone take care